thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me and thank you everyone for staying until the end. <laughs> this paper is about the economics of content moderation. So, so content moderation is this practice of social media companies of moving posts and banning users to enforce the rules that they have against hate speech, harassment, misinformation. Now, moderation has been pretty much in the spotlight recently. So, you know, all, all of these episodes of Elon Musk requiring Twitter pretty much centered around this discussion of freedom of speech and censorship. So this, this tweet is from one month, I think, before or a couple of months before he acquired it actually, actually but now there is an increasing pressure around the world to regulate this, this practice, but the problem is that there are still many unknowns. So regulators are pretty much in, in the dark when it comes to regulating this. Because, for example, we don't know very well whether users become more moderate or more radical. So we need empirical evidence. And it's also not clear how to trade off freedom of expression and the harms from this sort of content. So we need frameworks to make this trade. So in, in the paper, I tackle these two fronts. And specifically, I ask what is the effect of moderating hate speech on both user behavior and wealth? To answer this question, I run two field experiments on Twitter guided by a model. So in the model, moderation is a quality decision for platforms in the sense that it increases the user's willingness to engage with the advertisements. There's gonna be two implications from this model. The first one is that profit maximizing platforms only moderate if this has some benefits. So if this increases the engagement of at least some users, and the second implication is that because moderation is a quality decision, it can be over provided or under provided by the platforms. There could be too much moderation or too little moderation from the consumer's point of view. So then it becomes an empirical question. And my experiments are going to allow me to test this implication uh, from the model and also to overcome a major challenge, which is that platforms are in control of sanctioning users. And this means that, first of all, if we, if we want to study the effects of moderation, we need to come up with some form of generating some sort of variation in, in moderation, you know, you want to study its effect. Second, you know, it's, it's hard to collaborate with platforms in this sort of sensitive topic, so that there's not a lot of data or, or studies out there. And even, you know, using Twitter's API to detect this, uh, you, you need to do it like kind of like real time. Uh, you cannot like just do platforms. So the way that I, you know, get around this in the first experiment, what I do is I randomly report tweets that contain hate speech. <laughs> To sanction the user, and then I see how they change their behavior inside the platform. Uh, the second experiment, I, I run a survey to shift users' beliefs about moderation by giving them different information, and then I see how their consumer circles change. A preview of my results. First, these reports work, so there's a there's a first stage. Reporting increases the likelihood that Twitter deletes tweets. Second finding is that these uh, reports are not going to change the activity on the platform or the hatefulness of the authors of hate speech. So in other words, this content moderation does not always moderate the users. Third finding is that there's going to be spillovers on others. So specifically those that are attacked by hate. So the victims of, of hate, they're going to increase their activity when I report the authors of these hate posts. And finally, when we increase users' beliefs about moderation, this does not change their consumer source. And in the paper, I interpret this as evidence that Twitter does not distort this moderation policy. I, I, I don't think I'm going to have enough time to talk about the wealth part, but you can see. Very quickly, this paper makes two main contributions to the literature. The first one is providing these field evidence of the consequences of moderation. And the second one is modeling the underlying economics of moderation. So I borrow from the literature of quality provision and monopoly, and the more recent society market literature. There is some, some work uh, you know, in, the, in terms of modeling uh, some pioneering work on these platforms uh, moderation decisions. Now, very quickly, so today I'll, I'll talk first about the economics, then I'll give you some background of what is hate speech, uh, what we know about content moderation on Twitter. Then I'll talk about the reporting experiment and then finally conclude. But before going into the moral, I always like to ask, why do platforms model? Uh, if you think about it, the answer to this question is not very obvious because why does it make sense for, for a profit maximizer to sort of sanction some of its consumers if, for instance, it will instead raise their prices? And, and I'll be very clear with you what I mean by prices on, on social media. So to, to see this, just consider it as a 
simple case. So we have a, a platform and we have users that are going to be interacting with the platform. For now, I'm assuming that there's two types of users. There's acceptable users and, and hateful users. Although we can um, generalize this to multiple types. So you, you could think, for example, that Twitter has different, you know, its algorithm classifies users according to different types. You have Democrats, you have Republicans, and so on. Uh, there is some interesting thing, like, I, I don't know if you saw the leak, the recent leak, the one that was not the leak, actually, it was the voluntary leak of Elon Musk, the transparency of the algorithm. And there was a classification of different users. I think there were power users, there were Democrats, and Republicans. Uh, so, you know, you could think that there is different, different censorships or different moderation for each type of user, but for now, just assume that there's really there's going to be spillovers between these users to capture the usual network effects, but also to capture potentially some harms from hateful content. Whenever I read the post of somebody that is offending anyone else, I, I just get offended. Uh, and we can think that moderation, what it does is it decreases these spillovers. So it, you know, it decreases how others respond to this, uh, or the content of hateful users. Although I'm going to give it a more general purpose in, now, uh, users are going to, to make some decisions. So users are going to decide the amount of time that they spend on the platform, so their engagement. And the platform is going to choose two things. It's going to choose its prices and its moderation policy. Now, prices, because on social media, we pay with our time and our attention and our data. I'm going to think of them as the advertising loads or adver advertising frequencies. So for instance, when we're scrolling on Twitter and we want to consume five posts, we have to watch one app. Oh, when you're on YouTube and you want to watch a 10 minute video, you have to watch 30 seconds app. I'm going to allow the platform to price discriminate. So to set one different price for, for different type of consumer. This is not necessary. It's kind of like for technical purposes and sort of the, the predictions generalized into that or something. Uh, so users are going to get some utility from spending some amount of time on the platform. Here, there's not going to be any distinction between consumption and production of content. So it's just you spend 10 hours on Twitter and that's your, your engagement. And your utility is going to depend directly on your engagement. It's also going to depend on this uh, big T that is going to be, it's going to give us a spillover. So I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. It's also going to depend on this content uh, moderation rate. And we're going to have the time cost of this engagement. So this big T is going to capture these spillovers uh, and it's just going to be the aggregate engagement of each type. So the total number of hours that people spend on the platform on both sides. And moderation is going to reduce these spillovers as I, as, I, as I said, but it can also bring direct utility or disutility to people. So think for example of a hater who gets their account suspended and it's kind of like open up new accounts. That's going to generate a cost. So that, that will be in this utility function. Or think, for example, of somebody that likes to see others being punished because they're posting nasty stuff. So that's also going to be in this uh, utility. For now, I'm, I have like a very general utility function. I'm not imposing any assumption of how it depends with respect to these uh, spillovers. And we can think that this is useful because it can encompass, for instance, think of a minority user who dislikes hate speech, then their utility is going to be decreasing with respect to TH. Or a hater who likes to troll others, their utility might be increasing with respect to TH. Also, it's kind of like a general formulation. And W, WI is going to be the value of time or data. Uh, and we have the price, uh, which is the ads per, per day. Okay, so in equilibrium, we need to coordinate expectations. So we need to solve these fixed point problems. We have demand, users are going to decide the amount of time that they spend on the platform. Uh, they're going to take as given the uh, expectations of, of the engagement of others and take as given also moderation and prices. And in equilibrium, this demand has to be consistent with the actual engagement that is out there and like a rational expectations framework. So we need to solve this fixed point problem. It looks kind of complicated, but there's a very elegant solution from the two-sided market literature. And the solution is just to notice that these uh, demands are decreasing with respect to prices. So essentially, we can just pass the, the prices to the other side and obtain this object, these inverse demands. And what this means is that these are just prices that allow the platform to effectively choose the engagement of each side. So this, what this means is that Twitter has this, or any platform has these policies that effectively allow it to choose its quantities. 
So in other words, it's Twitter's advertising policy that determines size and prevalence of, of uh, hate speech. And we can generalize this, for example, to have like uh, customized advertising load for each user or just a single advertising load for everyone using different assumptions. And we obtain essentially the same uh, predictions. What is essential is to realize that the platform has many tools that allow it to determine its quantity, not just the content moderation. So in that sense, content moderation is not a quantity decision, but it's going to be a quality decision. I'll explain in a second. Now, the problem of the platform is to maximize profits, which are advertising revenue minus costs. For now, I'm just assuming an advertising-based uh, business model. Uh, you can see an art paper for, you know, uh, also a subscription-based business model, and also some different assumptions on the technology that platform, platforms use. And the platform is going to, uh, the problem is simple. They're just going to sell advertising minutes at a fixed price, A, which is the number of, the amount of dollars that you, the, you as an advertiser pay per uh, unit of advertising. For now, I'm assuming fixed price just for simplicity, but you could easily let this, for example, uh, relax this assumption and assume, for example, that there's a different price for acceptable users and for hateful users, or for instance, to assume that platform is kind of like a price setter on these advertising markets where it has some sort of you know, market power in, in advertising or some brand safety concerns. Think of like the advertisers who dislike to have their advert ads placed next to some free speech. You could easily generalize this assumption. Well, the problem is just max, choose uh, quantities and, and moderation to, to maximize advertising revenue minus costs. Here on the cost side, you could think that there are some penalties, for instance, from or from regulation, think for example of, of Germany, Germany's net network enforcement act that penalized platforms for not removing content that would be here in the cost function. Um, and as well, for instance, it's quite resource intensive to, to moderate. So, you know, you have to hire humans to review posts and so on. So all of that will be here in the cost function. If you take first order condition of this problem with respect to the quantities, you get the usual monopolist condition, marginal revenue plus marginal cost. So that's Pretty standard. And the new part is this quality decision, uh, as in this paper by Spence 75. It's a quality decision in the sense that it increases the willingness to pay for the platform. So just take first order condition with respect to moderation, and you obtain that the value of the increase in advertising time has to be equal to the marginal cost. To give you some intuition, this just imagine a, a reasonable assumption, which is that the acceptable users, they their demand increases when we moderate more. And the haters, their demand decreases when we moderate more. So on the acceptable user side, now you as a platform have a higher amount of ad minutes that you're able to sell. On the hateful side, you have lower ad minutes that you're able to sell and you have, you have, you have to trade off this too. So that's kind of like one of the main trade-offs for platforms. And it captures some intuition of many people, for example, that say that if, if you're Facebook and you want to take down a page, a conflicted page, if you leave it, then you have offense some people that, that see that there is something bad going on in that page. If you take it down, you offend freedom of expression. So it's a typical trade-off for the platform. So the key parameters of, of platforms decisions are going to be just rewrite this condition in terms of things that we can actually observe. So we can rewrite in terms of elasticity, so elasticity of engagement with respect to these prices and how engagement changes with respect to this content moderation policy. These are going to determine the platform moderation decision. It turns out that most of these parameters are unknown. So we don't know very well how engagement responds to prices or advertising loads, and we don't know very well how it responds to moderation. What I'm trying to do in my paper is to inform about this one of these parameters, which is the elasticity with respect to the uh, Okay, so there's two implications from, from this model. The first one is that it don't only makes sense to moderate if there is some benefit. Uh, you can see that here on the, on the first order condition. So if this part is, is moderation is quite resource intensive, we need this part to be positive. And the way to do it is either left hand side, this part is positive or this part is positive. So somebody needs to engage more with the platform. And the second is the usual quality distortion uh, that we know very well, which is this tension between the average consumer versus the marginal consumer. So the platform is going to cater to the marginal consumer. And so we're going to ignore whatever happens to the intramarginal. Uh, 
And of course, this is this concept of welfare is just including the, the welfare of, of consumers. It ignores completely what happens outside the platform. So think of the effect, for instance, of moderation on hate crimes and so on. Uh, but then, you know, it becomes an empirical question of whether there's too much moderation or too little. Some quick background. So uh, we can think that hate speech on Twitter is a useful case study. So hate speech is the most common violation on the platform. And Twitter is used by roughly one quarter of thoughts. What is hate speech? Well, Twitter's definition is uh, slurs or attacks based on protected categories. The way that uh, we measure it depends. There's many different uh, ways of measuring it. In, in my paper, I, I combine different approaches. So to measure kind of like in bold hate speech, I use the toxicity score that we were talking about before. Uh, Google's toxicity score is widely used in the industry, uh, sometimes as benchmark also in academic papers. For sampling these uh, hateful posts, I use keywords. And then for interpretability, I use uh, human annotation. Just to give you a sense of how this toxicity score works, so I'm just plotting here the, the distribution of toxicity in, in a random sample of tweets. And this toxicity score does, does pretty well, a reasonable job if you're trying to distinguish between kind of like obvious types of offenses versus neutral language. It doesn't do very well when we're trying to distinguish, for instance, more subtle types of, of hate speech versus neutral language. And that's why it's important to have different approaches, capture precisely types of, of hate speech that is simple uh, cut of rule. This is the usual cut of rule that the literature uses, but this, this does not capture. And these are these are going to be kind of like the two keywords that I'm going to use in my experiment. Now, what do we know about moderation on Twitter? Well, there's essentially three stages of, of this process. There's the production of content detection and then the enforcement of rules. Now, nowadays, there's even some enforcement of the rules at the production stage. So if you're trying to reply something offensive uh, to somebody else, you receive like a, a prompt Twitter saying, that, you know, that's not nice. Uh, even for instance, today, I, I just saw there's an issue with the Substack. If you're trying to post the Substack in links, you cannot do so. So that's kind of like also at the content production stage. But roughly speaking, it's you know it's production. Then the content gets detected if via algorithms or via humans, and then the content can be deleted. Users can be suspended. There's also shadow ban. So whenever Twitter hides you from from the visibility of of the algorithm, that's a shadow ban. And there's also some other sanctions. So think of locking people's accounts for a certain amount of time, and so on. Uh, some some quick statistics that are surprisingly scarce in the literature. Roughly one third of people have reported content, and a lot of them do it in, on behalf of somebody else. And this is exactly what I'm going to do in, in, my, in my experiment. In terms of prevalence of hate speech, depending on how you measure it, but it could be from 0.1% to 5.6% of tweets are, are hate speech. And in terms of the, the, the C in the model, so the likelihood of moderation, from 2.5 to 9.1% of, of hateful content is, is removed. And similar figure, this this from the data that I collect, similar figures we saw in, in the Facebook leaks, uh, the Facebook documents, we saw that there was also like a 3.5% to 5% of content, of hateful content that is removed. How it works, uh, you get your tweet deleted and you see this uh, notification here saying that it violated the rules. And then you receive an update say, from Twitter saying you violated the rules. We you need to delete your post in order to continue and your account is locked for a certain amount of time. Uh, okay, so now the experimental design. Here I ask whether moderation moderates actually the users and whether also it impacts, uh, it has some impact on, on the victims. So the sample is I, I collected 6,000 tweets in real time. Uh, I impose some quality filters, excluding bots and so on. And I sample based on keywords. So I use essentially two, two keywords. One is based on a disability slur that you know some people in, in the literature consider debate whether it's hate or not. In, in, on Twitter, Twitter forbids things uh, discriminating very based on disability. And we can think of this kind of like as a gray area type of, of language. It turns out most of my sample ended up being in, in this uh, slur just because it's uh, very frequent. But I also have some uh, Sample some tweets based on this Holocaust denial. I tried with other slurs, but 
many of them are appropriated by minorities so this creates you know an issue based on, on you know just beyond ethical reasons but also problem of measurement error in the sense that you know i could sample a lot of, of tweets that are not actually hate speech this is not so the case in this with these two two keywords i asked some humans to review this content and tell me what's whether they thought it was hateful or not and essentially the measurement error with these two keywords was like three percent or something so um, even if i use this selected sample it still covers a lot of different topics so covid sports religion and so on and so the treatment is uh, we can think of this reporting as an instrument for for moderation in the sense that it satisfies these two conditions that we were just discussing now so it satisfies uh, uh, relevance and monotonicity so presumably it increases the likelihood that we're against tweets or i mean sanctions users uh, it also does not affect user behavior directly so users are not being notified that they whenever they are reported but not sanctioned so if we could observe all sanctions perfectly it would be a, a perfect issue it turns out that we can't uh, so I'm, I'm also going to focus on the, on the reduced form and what I do is I report half of the tweets the next day after they enter my sample. Uh, and I do this just because it's natural to have a tweet like that was recently posted to have it reported the next day instead of reporting things of one year ago. And also to avoid saturating Twitter so I can spread these reports over, over two months. I stretched like the treatment by the sampling date and, and the slur, and I did this from 11 different accounts. So I, I created like 11 accounts to, to report. Uh, and the way that it works, you just <laughs> keep report, and then uh, you have to keep more information. So think that it's abusive or, or harmful. And then sometimes you receive some updates from Twitter saying that these accounts indeed were violating the rules uh, against hateful content, and so on. The outcomes that I'm going to be measuring, yes, just, just, oh, just, just a little curiosity on that. Is this all manual? Yeah, it was manual. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the other question I had though was, um, you know, oftentimes uh, websites will look at kind of when a uh, account is creating multiple reports, they might consider this a spam activity. Yeah. Alternatively, they also might look at kind of the accuracy of these reports and actually might see that the effectiveness of the reports is not really high. Yeah, so yeah. you said the account level analysis, but is there also kind of over time to see the effectiveness of the reporting going up? Yeah, these are all great points. So uh, just to get back at the manual thing, I had to do it manually because the terms of service, you know, for me to do these things uh, automatically. So that's why I did it all manually. Um, I just reported once if, uh, each tweet, so I didn't report it from multiple accounts. That's the IRB asking me to do it. Uh, and I look at the treatment effect over time, and I see that the effect is mostly flat. So there is no that that at least that dynamic part is not happening. What is happening? Something interesting is these uh, updates. I re received a lot at the very beginning. You know, every time I reported, it was like, oh yeah, we received an update. But then after I, I after some time, I stopped receiving these reports. So I think that the, the platform probably has some some sort of algorithm that makes you when you start reporting, it's like, oh yeah, thank you. But then it's like, okay, stop uh, sending you reports. Uh, but it didn't affect somehow the first stage. Of the, what do you know about what happens after you report before you either receive or don't receive an update about your report? Yeah, so that's a black box, and I don't know what the process there. I don't know if it's reviewed by a bot or like an algorithm, if it's manually reviewed by a person. The only information that I know is that according to Twitter, they detect 50% of content with algorithms and 50% with humans, but other than that, I don't know what goes with that black box. I remember reading that three months there was a manual component that was fixed. Yeah. And what has been changed? I don't doubt it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, the interest, the story of Twitter is, is super interesting. So they started being kind of like a, a free speech platform and they didn't do a lot of moderation. Then they started doing a lot, I think 2015 or something, and they invested heavily in, in hiring human humans to review content. But nowadays, who knows? Yes. It's possible to see the control group also get deleted, like, like someone else might. Yeah, exactly. But that would be kind of balanced. 
that's a good thing. You'll see it in the, the okay. Uh, so the outcomes are first stage outcomes, which are sanctions and, and uh, just uh, observable sanctions, which are going to be deletion of tweets, suspension of users, or shadow banning. I, there is an official measure of shadow ban, and, and indeed, there are actually it nice that they do shadow bans, but there's some, some evidence that they actually do. Uh, so I'm, I'm using these sort of imperfect algorithms. But there's more unobservable sanctions, and these are going to violate the exclusion of exclusion. Now, there's second stage outcomes as well, which, which are motivated by the mode. Yes, David, you have a question? Um, I'm the unobservable uh, shadow banning. Like, I know, I think you mentioned this in the source code for the ranking algorithms released. Obviously, that's maybe not the way that I'll study but do you, do you know have you looked to see if there is just like a negative gain if anything is the thing as good because that would yeah kind of like give you some sense of at least a little piece of it. yeah for sure there is there is and, and it looks like this uh, uh transparency is super interesting because you can actually see the weights of, of things and there is for number of reports number of blocks number of links as well Yeah, 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 it's, it's very kind of like, so yeah, for sure. I mean, there is some, some shadow banning, and there's different types of shadow ban as well, like search shadow ban. Like, there's many different types, and I don't know why Twitter uh, denies that they, they do it. It's, anyway. uh, okay, second stage outcomes is uh, engagement, and I don't observe directly the, the number of the amount of hours the user spent, but I make like an index measure based on the amount of posts that people read. Or, or, or um, based on, on the likes that they give and the amount of posts that they give. And I combine this into like an index based on the reading and typing, typing speeds, the hatefulness of posts, so the, the toxicity of whatever they post, and the spillover to the engagement of other users. Data comes from the now <laughs> extinct uh, Twitter's API uh, and also manual collection. And results uh, first, reports. Uh, work so they increase the likelihood that Twitter leads tweets by 66 percent and it's 66 percent but it comes from a low baseline of 0 0.02 0.02 the control group uh, and there was no other other effect on observable sanctions you think about suspensions shadow ends, removal of other tweets self deletions or attrition and so on uh, there is some interesting heterogeneity here so for example by account by reporting accounts, so I did this from 11 accounts. And you can see that the mo most of the heavy lifting came from three accounts. So this is account number one, two, and, and four. And I was not expecting this exactly, but I suppose there were some interesting things. For example, account number one is the one that I used for recruiting purposes on, on the platform. So, I mean, I don't know if it's just because Twitter trusts its account more, or it's the one that actually brings money to, to the platform, but it's the, also the, the one that, it was more successful. And uh, besides that, I mean, uh, most of the effect came in the, in the first five weeks, in, sorry, in the first five days right after the report, and then it, it remained flat. There was some other interesting heterogeneity based on the number of accounts that uh, these, these, uh, the, the users who were posting hate speech followed, their age, the likes per day, and so on. Uh, there is evidence of unobservable sanctions, and I cannot observe these perfectly, but I have to imperfect measures by an observable sanction i mean for example you know you you get a, like a locking period where you cannot use platform 12 hours there's no way of observing that in the data but there is some some measures so for instance i use these updates so i, I recorded the updates that twitter was sending me and i could see for example that i received an update on four percent of the cases in which i did not see an observable sanction that could mean that you know I'm mismeasuring my first stage by four percentage points, but uh, the problem is that not all sanctions trigger one of these updates. So I could be underestimating in that sense. So only 15% of sanctions trigger one of these updates. So on the one hand, this could be an underestimation. On the other hand, I don't observe these updates for the control group. So you know I could be overestimating the first stage. I do some uh, bounding exercise. So for example, if you assume different things, if you assume that uh, Twitter doesn't lie, like Twitter sends you updates only whenever it uh, sanctions people, you can bound the, the unobservables in the treated group at like 4%. If you 
besides assume, for example, that the rate at which Twitter sends updates for the observable sanctions versus the unobservables is the same, you get a, an exact measure of the unobservables at 24%. So just to give you a sense of, of the magnitude. I, was all, I also used another measure, which is, you know, if you get your account locked for 12 hours, there is a period in between posts that you cannot, like, you cannot do anything. So I was measuring every day the gap in between posts and kind of like adding it up. And I do see an effect on, on, on this gap around day number 10. The significant one will collapse everything into a single estimate. So, you know, there's some suggestive evidence that there is something going on besides the present stage. I didn't see an effect on the user activity or hatefulness. So the hours that users spend on the platform, the, the hateful users spend on the platform does not change. And also their hatefulness pretty much does not change. The same is true for other resources activity, extensive margins and so on. So, Exactly. By construction, I should be, and actually, you see the, the treatment effect is actually a little bit positive. So, uh, even on top of that uh, mechanical effect, there is no, no other effect. And, and when you think about it, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll tell you a little bit more about why I think we observe these patterns. Uh, but let me go into the, this measure of spillover. So, there is going to be some spillovers of the activity of the, what I call the victims. To try to get at who are the victims of this hate speech, I measured the activity of the replied users. So some, some of the hate in my sample replies to other users, and this is what I call the replied user. And uh, you cannot see, but 84% of posts were replies. And it turns out that reports increase the activity of these uh, replied users. So there is an effect on the, these uh, users of roughly 10 minutes per day. Uh, so they increase their activity once I report the, the original post. Yes, they reading. reading is based on the likes. So it's how many tweets you like. That's the only measure that I have. I cannot actually see the number of whole things that you need. At least not in this uh, project. I, I have another project which we have a browser extension and then we can see the whole, like the whole thing that you see, but not in this one. That, uh, uh, that's uh, something that I cannot say. So that I think I would like to say a little bit more about the mechanisms of how these people are reacting in this way. I don't know if, for example, they are reporting the user as well, and if they are not being notified, like, hey, yeah, we took action with this person, or if it's just that they notice the it's being tweeted and so on. I cannot I cannot tell that. And it's a limitation of using this sort of external data. Can you uh, create a fake replied user uh, and hate speech against them and yeah. report it from account number four? Yeah, so I think I think this is a one way to go and kind of like creating like a new lab. I think that's the way to go. I forget what I said. Uh, okay, so these not all of these reports are are attacks actually so sometimes people just reply among friends and just each other so to tease out which of these are actually attacks or not i asked some some of workers to classify okay tell me which of look at these two posts this is the relationship these accounts follow each other or not and tell me if this are, it's, a, it's an attack or not and most of them were, were attacks and the effect is stronger in subsample of things that are attacks so when their posts were attacks there was no effect on the the replied user Whenever posts were attacked, we see that the reply user increases their, their activity. So that's why I say the victims, because they, they are sort of victims of these attacks. And this result is robust to many different specifications, multiple hypothesis testing, correction, outliers, deleting outliers. And the effect is significant up to two months of data. So all of these um, outcomes that I showed you is at the three weeks, but I kept collecting up to two months of data, and, and I see it. Sorry, I kept collecting up to one um, six months, but the effect is significant up to two months. Uh, lastly, and, and I still have some time to talk about the welfare part, so let me just go quick with the welfare component. So to get at the welfare question, the welfare question is whether platforms moderate too little or too much. And the logic of why it makes sense to actually ask this question comes from this Spence uh, paper, and just the idea is that the monopolies 
an oversupply or undersupply quality. And again, the intuition is catering to the marginal consumer versus the average one. And the logic of the test is just measure consumer surplus, vary moderation a little bit, and then see whether we're to the left or to the right of the, sort of the optimum. And that's what I try to do in this experiment. So the, it's, a, it's a survey experiment with 3,000 Twitter users. And I vary the, the, so we need to vary this likelihood of moderation. The way that I do it is I give them different information. So on the left, you see you see the, the same messages. And the only difference is that on the left, they see that Twitter removes 3% of tweets. On the right, you see that the Twitter removes 9% of tweets. And all of this is done without deception. It's just I'm changing the, the way in which I categorize in hate speech. So, you know, presumably one is going to update their belief that there's going to be a higher like moderation on Twitter. It turns out that when we do this, Consumer surplus does not change. And what do I mean by consumer surplus? It's just the willingness to deactivate this, uh, their social media for, for one week. And we see that in both treatment arms, uh, essentially consumer surplus remains the same. And it's not just on, on average, but also on the whole distribution remains the same. This could be for many different reasons. So it could be, for example, that people are not actually noticing that this, this uh, treatment could be too subtle. So it's just 3.6% versus 9.1%. So to get at that, I asked them at the end of the survey, I asked them to repeat the information that I gave them. And I also asked them to tell me what do they think is the likelihood of moderation on a separate platform, so on Facebook. And I did see that there was a treatment effect on these two variables. Um, it's just that it didn't have an effect on their consumer service. Uh, so it could be for many different reasons. It could be, uh, it could be that you know, the, the, this measure is imperfect and, and so on. Indeed, after, after this treatment, I did see that they increased their activity on the platform one week after the formation experiment. And in fact, the, their activity patterns are very consistent with the first experiment. So I, I just think that there's a little bit more work to be done on, in terms of measuring welfare on social media. Now, just to wrap up, there seems to be some simple economics behind moderation. So I argue that platforms moderate to increase the activity of at least some users. And it seems that they can do this without reducing too much the activity of others. And if you think about it, so this, this, is, this is kind of like the parameters that I was after. It makes sense that we observe these patterns in the data because I send these reports to Twitter and Twitter is going to decide on which of them is going to act or not. So going back to the compliers question of earlier, so the compliers are going to be the case. If I'm Twitter, I'm going to decide to act on the, on the cases where I see a big benefit and I don't see a big cost on, on the side of, of the hateful user. I didn't see big uh, distortions in terms of welfare, or, you know, gains or losses in terms of consumer surplus. But what this means is that most of the welfare changes uh, could come from outside of the platform. So the effect of moderation, for instance, on, on hate crimes, I have some work on uh, the effect of moderation on hate crimes. And finally, even if I rule out this sort of this distortion, this welfare distortion, I don't want to say that Twitter is doing everything perfectly. So you remember this for the first order condition, there is the usual monopoly distortion, marginal revenue equals marginal cost. What this could mean is that, you know, the pricing or, or the advertising policy of Twitter is suboptimal. So it could be, for example, showing too few ads to haters, which could lead to too much hate speech. And there's really not a lot of work on, on that area of, of that distortion specifically. Yeah, you have a question. Uh, on your second point of uh, doing the activities, yeah. Is it possible that if I get reported deleted one time, it's okay, I want it to maximize the gains? Like if someone keeps doing that, you know, then, uh, it keeps happening after we just maximize the gains. So you can just yeah, keep, uh, keep reporting the same person over and over to see what happens. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that was one of the requirements why I be able to just do it once. Um, I think, I mean, this, what I showed you is evidence of one specific policy, like it was, reporting people and it seems that the only effect is through sort of tweet deletions and, and you know, sort of sanctions. There's other policies which is for example banning people and so on. I don't have a lot to say about that. It could be that they the third implement those other policies. Or more repeated, more repeated like I believe 10 times different. Yeah. No, I think that there's a lot of work to be done on that, like varying the different reporting and so on. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks again to the organizers for having me here. And it's always a pleasure. I'm a big fan of Raphael's work, overall body of work, as well as this paper. So you can take this as not so much as a discussion, but more of a pitch for why you should all read this paper and why you should all cite this paper. Uh, in general, I think there are two sort of takeaways from this, this uh, paper. A, maybe there is much error for nothing, right? We are all reading and too much of, of almost exposed to these complaints about content moderation and free speech discussions. Some ways, Raphael's paper shows that consumers don't seem to respond so much to these sanctions, uh, at least the consumers who seem to be punished for it. So maybe indeed it's much out of nothing. But the second part of the experiment, which Raphael didn't go, and I'm actually not going to spend too much time on, it also seems to show that consumers don't really have much of a, a uh, a willingness to accept or willingness to leave a platform if the platform is actually um, creating high content moderation, meaning high levels of higher levels of sanction. It is, as Rafael said, it's not really, really high numbers, it's about 9%. But then that generates this, uh, this gap between stated and revealed preferences. If consumers are comprehensive and there are surveys that indeed they seem to spit, they seem to have some taste for content moderation. They're complaining and, and demanding more content moderation. Why are they not willing to, to leave the platform? So there is this question, and in some sense, something similar to the, to the paradox of privacy, the privacy paradox, there's a, a content moderation puzzle as well that's waiting to be tackled for the PhD students. So um, let's go in. In general, we don't really have a very good definition of content moderation. Everybody understands something slightly different. I'll define it as setting some governance rules around production, dissemination, and access to information. Who gets to do that? That's defined largely by platforms. But in general, if we think of this information, of course, we can think of various different rules that are set by various different agents for various different purposes on who gets to access and create information. Of course, we can think of a dictator. Right? You can think of a dictator who just simply decides to censor information because that gives him or her, or sometimes him, power to gain uh, or maintain political power. We can think of a social planner, like uh, in Germany, there's a, a hate speech law, uh, who might be interested in maximizing some kind of an outcome, such as the well-being of individuals. And of course, we can think of, and we should think of, corporations and platforms who can set rules in order to maximize profits. And thanks to political economy literature, we know a lot more about number one and number two. We don't have enough studies on number three, and I think this paper is filling a really nice gap in the whole that aspect. And we need more work, definitely more work in this area. So uh, just going on again, the idea of contact moderation, I'm going to just now take you to a fictitious world. Let's assume that we can have a, a, kind of this very unsophisticated world where everybody has some kind of a preference for content in terms of exclusivity. And we can range these individuals, sort these individuals from zero to one in terms of their taste uh, for less offensive and, and more offensive content. And somehow let's also assume that people's tolerance for hateful content was somehow correlated, uh, correlated with their tendency to create hateful content. So in that sense, content moderation question becomes, again, in this very, very simple world, is something like setting, deciding where to set a line of how to pick people out of a platform. In this case, you're picking a lot of people who are potentially creating hateful content. In another world, you might be setting less linear rules. You might say, okay, I'm going to kick out only so few people for creating offensive content. But at the same time, you might be losing some others because they simply do not like to be around those people, the additional people who are creating right, hateful content. So you have a straight off for any company, right? Where to set that line? That's essentially the, the question. And with lots of abuse of notation, then it translates into something like how by changing that Y line with some marginal level, how does this demand on the platform and how does the potential fees, willingness to pay of these users change, respond to that decision of Y? 
right? And we need estimates for this. We need to understand these elasticities. And this paper is really trying to get at that through two different field experiments and asking questions like, you know, broad questions that anyone can be interested in. Like what percent of all the content that's generated is hate content? What happens if you start now sanctioning movies that fly? What happens to the demand? What happens to people's engagement? Goes beyond the beyond the two elasticities that I mentioned and that provides us with some answers. And largely from experiment number one, we learned first of all that the prevalence of hate content is really small. The uh, number that I'm more familiar from an earlier version of the paper is actually 1%, but there's a range depending on how you look at different hate content. And then, despite the fact that this is really low, if you flag a content, the likelihood that Twitter is going to take an action on this hate content is also quite small, three, up to 5%. Um, what's surprising perhaps is that the user who's Sanctions is not really responding in terms of the time that they spend or the toxicity. And I'll get back to that in a second. But maybe there's some positive effects. There are positive spillovers on the attacked users. They seem to be a little more engaged. But at the same time, you should have this question in terms of interpreting that, that magnitude. The non flagged or attacked users engagement increases by about 10 to 13 percent. But given the numbers of how much time people spend, does that really amount to a lot of time? It's about 10 minutes per week, if I remember the number. So um, is this a, a real game in, in some sense from, from the perspective of a platform? So that's a question. Well, let's go into a few comments uh, without dragging it too much. So um, I think there's a lot to like about this paper. It's really well done. Uh, a couple of things, of course, I think about why the, the percentages are so low and try to come up with ideas for why perhaps they might be so. One thing is, of course, as Raphael mentioned, he's sampling these tweets, uh, the 24 hour records. So what he sees from the time of creation or time the, 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 uh, the tweets become available and go into the API, till he samples. We all know there's some kind of automated machine learning response. First of all, that might be potentially sensing some, some of these uh, tweets out and then whether there would be some flagging down in, in that period that might reduce the amount of hate content that gets to make it to the sample. So that might potentially, it's not a, a threat to the design of the, the re, uh, research design, but it's, it might indicate that these might be lower, lower bounds. Um, one thing that surprised me, and of course these are just averages, but the average user in the sample has 4,800 followers. <laughs> Right, uh, post 12 tweets a day, and I consider myself an active on Twitter. I don't post 12 tweets, but of course, it's the mean. The point is made there must be a lot of heterogeneity in that, and, and I didn't see much of a breakdown in terms of the activity in the paper. Um, one challenge, of course, hate content tends to appear in answers, in response, uh, response manner, and that might mean, of course, there's going to be potential spillover to the, to the, uh, to the control group. And does Twitter's algorithm learning never questions versions of this question? When you flag, does Twitter learn anything from that? Does Twitter, for instance, look at the rest of the tweet uh, thread or look at people who might be more likely to be connected to you? And if there's indeed some kind of correlation in the way that the rest of the, uh, the content is treated, even if they're in the control, they might be also impacted, which is all to say that perhaps we are looking at lower bound estimates and perhaps that can explain why these numbers are fairly low. The second thing, this is um, the idea of shadow bands. This actually picture, I took it as a screenshot from Twitter's website. So despite all these discussions that we've been seeing in the last couple months about Twitter denying that they are doing shadow bands and so on, this was before Elon's takeover, by the way, they, do, they did admit from their own website that they actually did actively limit the visibility of tweets or engage in shadow banning. Um, and you know, this wasn't much of a, for, and, and they do this, of course, for potentially harmful content. Um, Rafael is doing all he can from co by collecting additional data, external data to be able to address this issue. But we still have a lot that's unknown in terms of if, if you have harmful content, if you're flagged, what happens to the ranking? What happens to the visibility, does it show up on top, does it show up three days later, if there's some kind of a chronological order issue, if there's a delay in how it shows up. So I think this is our, you know, this is a second reason perhaps those numbers are quite low. 
that we don't observe or we cannot do much about all the activity that is related to shadow bin. A third thing, uh, you highlighted also some of the things related to how slow the numbers were in terms of section. The punishment doesn't seem to be very clear by Twitter. There's also this idea that when you get banned or when your account is suspended, it's temporary. It's all 12 months, right? I mean, most users who tend to be on the, the long tail of things may not even notice, may not even be impacted by that 12 hour temporary ban. So I thought of this perhaps as an opportunity where there are variations in the, the type of uh, information that's given to individuals. I know that not everybody has, based on at least the paper, that everybody is sent this particular announcement that it will be 12 hours with the, the boldest fonts. So maybe there is a, a response based on how temporary the, the suspension is, how temporary the punishment is, and you can take advantage of that to, to go into the design question. The second experiment is showing that there are less uh, large misperceptions about hate speech. Most people tend to believe that hate speech is a lot more. And uh, they also believe that the uh, font moderation or the action that's taken by the platform is a lot. And that's again, going back to this paradox about why the status um, observations are so far from what we are getting from at least estimates from this paper. And then, despite the fact that again, Surveys, I'll show you one example. Despite the fact that many surveys indicate people want to see content moderation, here seeing high content moderation doesn't necessarily move people. One question here is you think of content moderation as a quality parameter. Could it be that it's more of a taste, right? In that case, you can expect a more heterogeneous response. Just because you have a higher moderation, it doesn't necessarily make everyone happy because I might get punished, right? If there's high moderation, and in other cases, people might have a higher degree of sensitivity and they might actually respond more negatively. So that heterogeneity is something that one may want to look into, and I think a larger sample might be able to allow that. And in fact, when you look into the minorities' um, responses, you have a few tables that you show that minorities claim that they are much more prevalent, they see hate speech much more prevalently, they are more exposed to it, but at the same time, their response doesn't seem to, to uh, change either. They don't seem to want to be in a, in a platform that does more content moderation, which seems again puzzling, which I think requires further examination and any research on this area could be really valuable. Uh, the final thing again, um, this is more of a cheap shot perhaps, but uh, you can see from some surveys, people seem to have some desire to see content moderation. They don't seem to act on it based on the research. We need to understand why. Um, the majority of the, the focus on this paper, even though there are two, disability and Holocaust, 98% is disability. And to me, that's a less contentious issue. Right? If you are punished because you had a, a disability remark, perhaps I don't respond. I don't hate Twitter for it. Because you should probably all agree that that's a, a disparaging remark. But there are some issues that are more contentious, like that political beliefs and other issues, anything around Trump, anything around misinformation. And I wonder if the results, the numbers will look similar for those more contentious issues. Again, uh, more work is required, but altogether, it's a really nice paper with a clever design. And it's an important topic. And I think Rafael has done in and out really, really good work. I hope to see this paper in print very, very soon. Um, thank you. That answer. I'm uh, Yep. Nah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mark, for the comments. Uh, in terms of the magnitude, so I did some back of the envelope calculations. I mean, there are with really, really strong assumptions, but the figure was like six dollars per per month that the platform gains with this report, which uh, I mean is kind of similar to the Elon Musk's eight dollar figure subscription. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how. I mean, it, it requires a lot of quick terms of just to give a magnitude. Um, uh, well, power. I think it's an interesting idea, but really hard to get at. It's really hard to implement with just external data. So one of the lessons I think in this paper is that you really need collaborations with platforms to analyze these topics. And I think they are a little bit more open now to, to do collaborations. I, I see like new papers that have like internal data, but back in today was not, not the case. Yeah. 
in terms of why there we see these misperceptions, I think it's interesting because well, we see the same thing with fake news, like Matt Ginsburg's paper on, on fake news. He also finds that there's something that like the prevalence of, of fake news is not so high as one would think. And I think a lot of it is also like the media. I, I've, I've seen the media pushing, well, TikTok is full of hate. And then you see, and, and it's like a selected sample that they were using to make that claim. You know? So maybe that's one reason why this perception. Willingness to accept, I think you're totally right. And, and it's probably a long tail, and not like hate speech is a long tail phenomenon. So yeah, probably would need like a really big sample to get a, really get a, a big effect. With the sample I got, we, it was able to detect 10, 0.10 standard deviation effects or so anything below that I'm not able to detect. So point well taken. And in terms of other slurs and like for instance, reporting Trump and so on, when I did this experiment, it was not possible to report, for instance, misinformation. Now they included the buttons to report and, and the elections and so on. Now they included more functionality. So I think there's a lot of opportunities to do this. So yeah, thank you.